This article, as you can see, obviously is confused about the church's mission, and the church itself is confused about its mission. The largest religious institution in the world, the Roman Catholic Church, has spent more time talking about climate issues than the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You tell me that there's some issue going on, and I'll tell you there is, and it begins with the church. It begins with the pulpit. It begins with people not recognizing because there is a famine for the word of God. People can no longer recognize and discern what belongs in this building and what does not. There's a lot of people that uh, attribute the Nazi propagandist Goebbels by saying if you tell a lie enough, it becomes the truth. I'm not sure if he said that or not, but I really believe that we are in a day living at a time when things are being repeated enough, deliberately, not for your benefit to improve or to help or to aid, but to get you to think a certain way. You may reject what I'm saying, but I'm asking you right now to keep an open mind on something that I'm about to share with you. This comes from The Guardian. And the headline says, Losing Their Religion, Why U.S. Churches Are on the Decline. So I began to read this. As the U.S. adjusts to an increasingly non-religious population, thousands of churches are closing each year, probably accelerated by COVID. Churches are closing at a rapid number in the U.S., researchers say, as congregations dwindle across the country and a younger generation of Americans abandon Christianity altogether, even as faith continues to dominate American politics. As the U.S. adjusts to an increasingly non-religious population, thousands of churches are closing each year in the country, a figure that experts believe may have been accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic. The situation means hard decisions for pastors who have decided, who have to decide when a dwindling congregation is no longer sustainable. It has also created a boom market for those wanting to buy churches with former houses of worship now finding new life. About 4,500 Protestant churches closed in 2019. The last year, uh, data is available with about 3,000 new churches opening according to LifeWay Research. I want to stop right there. I want you to notice something. There's only a mention of Protestant churches. There's no mention of Roman Catholic churches. There's no mention of synagogues, no mention of mosques, just Protestant churches. And if you're not reading carefully, which most people tend to gloss, 4,500 Protestant churches closed in 2019, 3,000 new churches opening. Well, that's a difference of 1,500 which if you think about it and you look at historically what happens in the cycle of churches, that may be a high number, but put in perspective, not really that catastrophic per se. And I'm going to tell you why I'm saying this. My issue with this is, you know, they say, well, due to COVID-19. No, it's not due to COVID-19. First and foremost, who implemented the, regu the regulations to Close houses of worship. Thank you, government, at least a few of us here on the same page. Don't blame something there when there is absolute fingers to point. But this article, very skewed. And if you're not reading some of these things very carefully, you'll miss the fact that this is actually an attempt to convince you of something you might say, well, you're delusional. No, I'm not, because I'm seeing growth. I'm seeing people come. I'm reading my mail and hearing people say, thank God for someone preaching the gospel. So, thank God for someone who hasn't watered it down. People are coming. You may not see them in the building, but I'm telling you the numbers that we see of people tuning in, logging on, and watching has been off the charts. So please don't succumb to what I am calling the greatest Propaganda, yes, is America sliding? Absolutely. But not for the reasons one might think. And when I begin to tell you a little bit about culpability, you can begin to put things in perspective and understand there is an agenda. 
And if we're, not, we're all not careful, you can fall into the agenda. As I said, if you repeat something enough, you convince people enough, people begin to think that's the way it is. Okay? Let me continue reading. The closures, even for a temporary period of time, impacted a lot of churches. People breaking that habit of attending church means a lot of churches had to work hard to get people back to attending again. In the last three years, all signs are pointing to a continued pace of closures, probably similar to 2019 or possibly higher. And there's been a really rapid rise in American individuals who say they are not religious. Protestant pastors reported that typical church attendance is only 85% of pre-pandemic levels, while research by the Survey Center on American Life and the University of Chicago found that in the spring of 2022, 67% of Americans reported attending church at least once a year, compared with 75% before the pandemic. Well, let me again pause right there. Attending church once a year is, you know, there are certain functions that we can say, if you do something once a year, does that qualify you to sit under the banner of something? I'm sorry, if you go to the bathroom once a year, does that mean that you have normal bodily functions? Forgive my frankness here, but this is what I'm finding quite offensive, to homogenize people who only go to church once a year versus those people who are actually interested and may attend on a more regular basis is to basically assume that people are generally disinterested and not very committed. So that's number one. Number two, while COVID-19 may have accelerated the decline, there is a broader long running trend of people moving away from religion. In 2017, LifeWay surveyed young adults aged between 18 and 22 who had attended church regularly for at least a year during high school. The firm found that seven out of 10 stopped attending church regularly. And you think that that is a real statistic because that is actually called the fact of life, okay? In all of our experience as young adults that began to basically be emancipated from the watching eyeballs of our parents, at some point, there's a breaking away. There's, I don't want to have the religion or the processes that my parents, that's a normal process that I think most people see their children go through until they become mature enough to realize that they actually need something bigger than themselves. So again, this is one of these interesting, let's put this out here and let's make it sound like all young people are disinterested. Some of the reasons were logistical. As people moved away for college or started jobs, which made it difficult to attend church. But some of the other answers are not so much logistics. One of the top answers was church members seem to be judgmental or hypocritical. Now, here's where you can start to see a little bit of an agenda. If a person is called into the pulpit to preach this word, then it is the pastor, the priest, the minister, whoever you are, it is your responsibility to ensure that every person listening understands one dynamic of the church. Everybody here, including me, is a sinner. There are no perfect people. There are no, uh, well, you've been saved now, so you're in a separate group. Lack of preaching has produced this mindset. And of course, I'm going to take you through a little bit of the history of this, but I want to finish this article to show you. It's like, you know, if I was writing this article, I'd at least be intellectually honest to tell you that there is a bigger problem going on. And I'd actually isolate the problem, which I'm going to do today, because I feel if I don't do this now, there are enough people who are exposed to this type of stuff. You'll read it online. You talk to people. And again, keep repeating it, it can become a truth for you. Keep repeating it, and you could say, well, that's just the way it is. We, we got to accept that this is happening. Okay. A quarter of young adults who dropped out of church said they disagreed with their church's stance on political and social issues. 
I'm going to repeat that for some of you who didn't laugh or might have missed that. A quarter of the young adults who dropped out of church said they disagreed with their church's stance on political or social issues. Well, you tell me where Jesus Christ ever intervened into the political forum. And if you want to say that Jesus did intervene in a social way, it was for the reasons that he himself articulated, not somehow to elevate or abase or to... So this, this article, as you can see, obviously is confused about the church's mission. And the church itself is confused about its mission. The largest religious institution in the world, the Roman Catholic Church, has spent more time talking about climate issues than the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You tell me that there's some issue going on, and I'll tell you there is, and it begins with the church. It begins with the pulpit. It begins with people not recognizing because there is a famine for the word of God. People can no longer recognize and discern what belongs in this building and what does not. Now, young people's uh, disagreement on political and social issues. Now listen, I have alluded to many things, but I'm going to tell you something. Years ago, I decided no politician comes here to stand on this pulpit or this platform to engage you. They have their own soapbox outside. Let them stay out there. This is God's house, not a politician's house. <laughs> Number one. Be seated. You'll, you'll see why this, is, this has been going on inside me for a long time, and I, I got to get it out because I think as I share this with you, there will be clarity for some people and a discussion that you may want to have with others around you who are sorely confused about the mission and what, where the church has failed, where we've gone wrong. And I use the term we, I'm not going to start pointing fingers at only these people, only these people. Let me continue, unfortunately, but let me continue. A study by Pew Research found that a number of Americans who identified as Christian was 64% in 2020, with 30% of the U.S. population being classed as religiously unaffiliated. And then they go on to say about 6% of Americans identified with Judaism, Islam, Hindu, and Buddhism. Uh, not sure about those numbers either because I checked somewhere else and I didn't see the same numbers. Since the 1990s, large numbers of Americans have left Christianity to join the growing ranks of U.S. adults who describe their religious identity as atheist, agnostic, or, quote, nothing in particular. That's interesting. Uh, this acceleration trend is reshaping the U.S. religious landscape. In 1972, 92% of Americans said they were Christian, but by 2070, that number will drop below 50%. Well, first, I'm going to say whoever's making this prediction is pretty pompous. There's no guarantee we'll be here by 2070. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's be real, okay? Especially in the current climate, let's be real about this. Um, so that number by 2070 will drop below 50%, and the number of religiously unaffiliated Americans or as they put it, nuns, that's not N-U-N, that's N-O-N-E-S, nuns, nothing, right, nuns, will probably outnumber those adhering to Christianity. Uh, now, it goes on to say, while grandparents might have been regular churchgoers, their children would say they believe in God, but not go to church regularly. By the time millennials came around, they had little experience or relationship with churchgoing or religion. In the Catholic Church in particular, the sexual abuse scandal may have driven away people who had a tenuous connection to the faith. The other thing is the pandemic. Now, I love the way this is all going to get smushed together here. Now, you've got pedophilia going on, and you got a pan the only thing they have in common is they both begin with a P, okay? That's about it. Please don't conflate the two. A lot of people who were weakly attached to suddenly... Um, have months of not going, then they're thinking, well, we don't really need to go, we found something else to do, blah, 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 blah. All right. Canada, Britain, France, Australia, New Zealand, the nuns, nothings, rise 
much earlier, in the wake of the 1960s, the baby boomer generation, this kind of big growing separation of a kind of traditional Christian moral morality. Not sure what that is, but it says what happens in America that I think dampens down the rise of these nuns is the Cold War. Because in America, unlike Britain, there's a very explicit kind of Christian America versus godless communism framing, and to be non-religious is to be un-American. Okay, I'm going to skip over something here. Uh, it says, but if you read, read on down here, it says basically that, for example, in Texas, there were fewer churches for sale than at any point in the last 15 years. Uh, they believe that's in part because of Texas' response to the pandemic, where the governor allowed the churches to open in early May 2020. And so there's all this rationalization. And I love the fact that there, there is one honest thing in this article. The honest thing in this article, it says a church will go through a life cycle. This is true. At some point, maybe the congregation ages out. Maybe they stop reaching young families. This is a true statement, and it is absolutely normal. By the way, it's almost normal not just for churches, but almost for any entity, institution, or business which has a life cycle that basically takes its time. You know, There used to be a big cafeteria, for example, downtown. Everybody used to go to this particular cafeteria until it died down. Businesses, institutions, and churches are not exempt from that, suffer the same problem. So I think I'm done reading this. It's kind of making me sick. So that's the article. Now let me tell you, I, I want to kind of flush this out because as I said, it's something that's been really just nagging on me. I really do see we are having to battle an attack, an attempt to brainwash, to make most Americans think that Christianity is dying or dead. And articles like this, which are in abundance, which keep getting put out there, well, put it out enough and maybe you'll, you'll begin to believe you're a dying breed. Now, I'm going to ask you a question before I get into reading everything I've put down here. Knowing what you know, having studied or read or heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, knowing what you know seems rather incongruent when you're reading something like this and you say to yourself, well, they're saying that this is happening and it's happening at a rapid rate and this is all versus reading the Bible, studying the Bible and recognizing we read about the power of God, the power of salvation, things that only God can do. And here is where the problem begins. You almost have to go back to the beginning of something to watch it unravel. This country if you really go back, and I'm not talking to Jesuits who came to convert, I'm talking about the genesis of this country as we kind of know it today. Whether you like it or not, was formed on protest. Whether you like it or not, the people who first, we'll call them the founding fathers, pilgrims came. They came here to escape persecution, to have religious freedom, to be able to worship freely without the ire of the Roman Catholic Church or even the Anglican Church prohibiting them. You look to the founding fathers, and although I can tell you, if you study history, you're going to see a very big core of the founding fathers came out of the Anglican Church on American soil. Remember, the English were here. And the staple before we basically had the spread of great evangelism and the great awakening was seeds planted by the Anglican Church. And if you trace back the history of the Anglican Church, the, the history there, again, is born through the Reformation, albeit people argue that it was only because Henry VIII wanted a divorce. I really don't care. The fact of the matter is that that was a breakaway from the Roman Catholic Church, and this country is the first Western nation to not be an arm of the Roman Catholic Church. If you think about the history of the world and the development, almost every continent at some point was ruled or regulated and controlled by the Roman Catholic Church. This is a brand new scenario that we have in this country. Now, if you think about it, 
early American evangelism, I'm not talking about, um, you know, 1950s. I'm talking about um, back there, like way back there. We're talking about, you know, after the first Bibles were printed here in 1663, when the word of God was being spread, people couldn't get enough. Early American evangelism had an integral part of sorting out the spiritual and social development of this country. And failure to go back and see where we came from conveniently and how we got here leads to where we are now. And because, I'm sorry, because most people are not intellectually honest enough to go back, look at history, and instead of wanting to revise it or to erase it or to eradicate it, look, listen, and learn from the past and recognize that we, have, we actually have great lessons if we're willing to discipline ourselves to see just where we went wrong. That's the big thing. No, it seems no one's willing to take responsibility here. We, we want to be relevant. We want to stay current. All right, well, let's just say that if we take the First Amendment that was graciously given to us, all right? Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the freedom thereof. If we understand what that means during the Great Awakening, people took those words, they had value, they had meaning, and from that we've got incredible, I mean, prolific amounts of gatherings of people listening to the gospel that basically made it so that essentially every town eventually in this country, every city, every center of every city had at least one church, and that was the epicenter of the city. You didn't go there for fun. You didn't go there because you liked it. You went because you knew that was where people went to hear about God and to learn about God and probably to come under conviction back in the day when people were preaching a lot more about sin and repentance which seems to be a missing ingredient in much of what is uh, put out there today. Now you've got people, for example, like George Whitfield, uh, originally Anglican, who basically, basically came to branch off and become basically the, the uh, propulsion for the Methodist church. Uh, but in all of this, his preaching would reach the masses, 18,000 sermons, 10 million hearers. We're talking about way back then. Yes, the doctrines, perhaps, if people look at them, and I'm talking about Calvinism or Arminianism, the concepts that, by the way, most Christians, most Christians don't even know what those terms mean. All of this, what I'm going to say today, comes back to we have stopped, the church at large has stopped educating people from this book. The church at large has stopped making people understand this is not something where you say, well, you know, I'll, I'll choose to do this, but rather this is something you, you actually need to hear, and then you make your decision. Just like the people who came to listen, the crowds that thronged Jesus, some of them came out electrified by the words, but unaffected. Others were gripped and followed. Has God changed? So what has? Well, it's, it's, it's a lack of something. It's, it's a big lack of something. In New England, you have someone called Jonathan Edwards who comes on the scene full of, under the sway of Calvinism. He brought the fear of God into the hearer's hearts. It was something almost so powerful that if you came under the persuasion of his preaching, you seldom could not be unaffected by it. Eventually, those ordained spokesmen would fade out and give way to full-fledged denominations such as Methodism and Baptist. And again, that would then break off into schisms. The fabric that originally was so tightly woven at the genesis of this country becomes what some have said 
somewhere into hundreds of denominations, hundreds, just here in this country alone, hundreds of them. Now, I don't have an issue with that because I, I understand that there are uh, interpretations. You know, some we've talked about, I've talked about this many times. When people say, well, why is that? Well, because people are not agreed, for example, whether people should be fully immersed in baptism or whether they should be sprinkled or whether we should baptize children or not. Some, some believe that a child should be baptized, an infant should be baptized. Others believe, such as myself, that it is something to do when someone has come to the faith. It is the statement that says, I've already made my stake. I have trusted Christ. This is my public declaration of my faith. But this is when we say denominations and branches of, of things, it's because we don't necessarily agree on the details. But the main core of the church, Jesus Christ lived, he died, he rose, he ascended, he's coming back. That, that kind of kept everything together. Once we start seeing a straying from the core of the church, I said this a few weeks ago. If you read the Bible, Bible says, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power. Basically, that preaching is the power unto salvation. No climate change is going to save you. I'm sorry if you belong to the cult of climate change. Good for you, but it's not going to take you to heaven. And I don't care what you say about whatever political affiliation you have. When you come in this building, you come into a house of God, your affiliation is to God and no one else. You try to figure that one out. You get into... You fast forward into the 1900s in this country. Names that should be familiar, but most probably younger folks don't even know somebody like Billy Sunday. You know, I actually asked somebody, they knew who Billy Sunday was, and they said, is he a cowboy? <laughs> Billy Sunday was a baseball player and a convert to Christ and began preaching prolifically under a tent. Many people came, whether they came because of his fame as a baseball player or because of his messages, who knows. But that particular time in America ushered in something called fundamentalism. And not as we know it today. It was in direct response. Funda fundamentalism was in direct response to how to deal with what was being pushed into society, evolution, science. How do, we, how do we remedy that? That's actually how fund fundamentalism started and then swung all the way to, if you breathe, it's a sin. Okay? It, well, it didn't start like that. So you have this genesis in these tent meetings, D.L. Moody and Tory and eventually others, who would, with the advent of radio, bring the message, evangelism, into your home. You didn't even need to leave. You could sit in your living room. And by the way, you could get convicted in your living room. You didn't even need to step out of the house. Until, of course, the advent of television. And now, of course, the age of technology and the internet. These are all incredible moments in, our, in the tapestry, in, in the fabric of Christianity in America, and to, to not even pay attention to what has changed, that's the greatest crime, to not recognize that if we are not careful, yes, we're, we're, we may be sliding, but please do not make a mistake and think, oh, the government said this, or this entity said that. Guess where it all starts? Right here. And if the minister of God is not willing to stand and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, open up this book and teach, you should not be listening. 
And that's not to say, you know, listen, you, you're prerogative. You do whatever you want. But if you're looking for something that is called Christianity and your pastor, your priest, your teacher, whoever you're listening to is more caught up in the, sorry, I'm just going to say it, the universe of equity, the universe of skin color. Do you know the racial divide that we have experienced in this country? Sorry, but if it was in the pulpit being preached as only one thing that matters, the red blood of Jesus Christ, not white, not black, not yellow, but again, wait a minute, because that's not being preached. We must now, this is boring, this is antiquated. We have to find something that, that stimulates us. So we'll bring in every subject other than the thing that we're supposed to be doing. We'll, I'm, I, I say we because I don't want to point the finger, although I have stayed by the stuff. I've stayed by the gospel. I have not deviated. But I can tell you when I talk to people, when I've read other uh, people's material, and I just think to myself, this single-handedly, don't point the blame somewhere else. But at the same time, and it's a paradox, somebody that says, I, I have this hunger, I desire to know, and you step into a church, and you are sitting in a pew, and the minister does nothing but a couple of hallelujahs, amens, and you walk out without actually having learned anything, you are responsible as well because you didn't decide to walk away. That's like saying, well, somebody put the drugs in front of me. I, 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 I didn't, you know, and, and then, then I just did it because it was there. Stop and think about this for a minute. And do not call yourself a Christian if you are not a follower of Christ. Don't attempt to put labels on things without understanding what it means. And this is my grievance here. If you think about how this country came into being, look at the founding fathers. Now, I can say, for example, we know George Washington, Anglican. And not too many people know this, but George Washington actually served in a church before he took political office. He was a servant of the Lord. Now, you go read that somewhere. I'm sure these are obscure facts that nobody really cares about. And you can go down the record of our founding fathers and you can see, well, maybe they weren't all religious, as people use the term. But their values, their morals, were rooted in God's word. You might say, well, now that's rich because this person did certain things or this person, you know, this president or this one did that. Okay, now you're, you're, you're entering into the territory of you're going to point the finger because you're perfect, because you've never sinned, because, because that's your right to do that. See, these are the problems that are not being flushed out. But if you go back to the Founding Fathers, there, there is one thing that they could agree on. Benjamin Franklin, Franklin was a deist for most of his life. And towards the end of his life, you can see a shift leaning heavier on God's word, truly. Jefferson had his own way, he had his own ideology, made his own Bible, cut out the things he didn't like, and there's the Jefferson Bible for you. But it, I'm going to say at least, you can say, well, that's not right either, but at least there were at least some concepts that could guide the society and give good moral footing. So the question, what happened to the church in America, why did the church sell out? Furthermore, better question for some of us who actually care. How did our government drift so far from its core values, the core values of the founding fathers, who actually, for the most part, had faith in God, or who were at least mildly influenced by the Bible? How did we go from the church being the epicenter in the city of every town or every village to basically a shell, something to gather, something to get a good coffee, have some entertainment, a meeting place, social, social grounds, right? Meeting like-minded people who love the Lord, but there's no message of Christ there whatsoever. How did we get here? 
I've said publicly there are factors. I'm not going to say there's one singular that I'm going to highlight, save what I'm getting to. You, know, you could talk about John Dewey's progressive education. You could talk about the demise of the family structure in America. You could talk about the rise of uber feminism. You could talk about the rise of the abasement of males in America. You could keep going. The list is abundant and long. But until we actually get back to some basic fundamentals, you can point the finger in every direction you want. But unfortunately, the problem is those are all the outside forces. And they have really, if you think about it, they do have very little to do with the outcome. I'll tell you what does happen here. The Bible says, without vision, the people perish. Let me tell you really what that means. Without the ability to look to God, without the ability to see God's intent, his purpose for his people, without vision of hope, without vision of faith, yes, the people perish. And the other side of that is, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So, if the gospel is not being preached, and we're not talking about faith as a tautology, faith and faith equals faith, we're talking about faith in Jesus Christ. So, if faith comes by hearing the word of God, and the word of God is not being preached, how can people have faith? How, do you just get it by osmosis? How do you get it? And there begins almost that self-examination. Let's not deceive ourselves. If you look at where we started in this country, liberty, top of the list. That's where we started, say 200, let's round it off, 250 years ago. Liberty, individual rights, limited government, <laughs> whoa Nelly. The place, protection, and role of religion, civil institutions, civil society that was to safeguard our democracy. And please do not be confused about the word democracy. If you don't know what it means, look it up. A lot of people toss that word around and they do not even know, especially in this day and age, and even your politicians on the Hill use this word, and I don't think people really know what it means. Look it up. 250 years later, almost, here are the ideas in conflict with what I just said, in conflict with liberty, individual rights, limited government, and so on. First thing we see here, that there are no fixed, grounded truths. Do you realize that? Let's start with our identity. You can believe what you want. Listen, I'm going to respect whatever. If you, if you want to believe that you were born a zebra, <laughs> OK. You were born a zebra. Good for you. But you know what? Keep it to yourself. I'm not interested in you trying to convince me and, and, and actually brainwash me into thinking you were born a zebra when I'm looking at you and I see you are a human being just like me. So that there are no grounded fixed truths anymore. You can be anything you want. It doesn't matter how, how you came into this world. You can be anything you want. And see, I'm a big believer in something. Here's the twist. I do believe you can be anything you want in this country, the land of freedom, success, opportunity. You can come here and be rags to riches. You can come here and you can work all your life and do whatever you want to do that I believe in. But what I don't believe in is trying to take truths that are immovable and convince you that there are no fixed truths anymore. You could take that right to the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, where people say, well, this has to constantly be evolving, living, breathing document. No, not so fast, friends, because that enables somebody to say, well, what it really means is by, by personal interpretation and completely lose sight of the fact that the Founding Fathers didn't only write those documents and produce them for the people, but they also wrote prolifically themselves. Look into it, George Washington, 
Jefferson, Monroe, Madison, which will tell you a little bit of their ideology of how they viewed America in its inception, the people, and the rights that they were trying to protect. Second thing is that our history, or history in general, is progressive. So, at the will of anyone, we can erase, we can revise, we can eradicate, we can change. Now, this is a very double-edged sword I'm about to say, but think of it this way. We all, as I said, are sinners. So imagine going to the first church of delusional minds, where the mindset is, you're now saved. That's true. Come into the church, accept Jesus Christ. He finds you. You see him. You get to know him. You're saved. But the delusional truth is that even when people say, Jesus washed and cleansed my sins away, which is true, to forget the rock or the pit that you were dug from is to create a person that is void of really recognizing the miracle of God perpetually. And that's a little bit of what's happened here. Not just personally, on a personal level for people, but historically across the board. Let's just, let's just make like it never happened. And we change the frame and the nature of things to where we can then just say, well, this is what really happened over here. When in fact, the reality is it's just not like that. So you can ignore God's word or his ways. The current thing is you find a path that works for you. If it works for you and it's good, then that's the path you should follow. And this is what happens, the question that comes on the scene. Then why does religion matter? Or better yet, the new religion, which is not this book. I'm not saying everybody who reads this book is going to become a Christian. I'm not saying everybody who reads this book is going to say, yes, I believe, but it gives a compass, at least a starting point, to have the ability to sort out to some degree right and wrong, good and bad. To some degree, exposing yourself to this book, it doesn't mean that everyone who has contact will be saved. But it does mean people who are able to open their minds and look into this book and realize that there are some very, I've heard people say, good instruction for living, who weren't Christians. I'll take that. I'll accept that. But how are we to stop this? How do we stop even more decline? So I'm going to tell you what I get to the message, and the message is probably pretty quick. When I say this, some of you are just going to go, wow, that's it? No, it's not, but hear me out, because don't think you know what I'm going to say. The first thing that is needed is faith, but don't just go, oh, yeah, okay. Hear me out. Unless you really understand what that means, it's not going to do a damn thing. You know, people say, oh, I have faith. You know, Jesus said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, and I want you to stop and think about that, the microscopic small little mustard seed, right? And he said that faith could move mountains. And most people kind of make it into a caricature. But I want you to think about it this way. Faith in that regard would be like this. I come to know him, familiarize myself with him by faith. And by faith, I believe he comes to know about me, everything there is to know about me. And as I take this word and I begin to basically implement it, take it into my mind, and it begins to permeate every fiber of my being. It doesn't make me some puritanical, monastical, locked away out of reality. It makes me alive in Christ. That is the genesis of the mustard seed that can take root. Something so small, and I'm going to tell you something. Most people, when they say, I have faith, don't even understand what that means. It's not... I'm a neon sign. It's a mustard seed. And that mustard seed taken inside has the power to give strength, to give courage, 
because part of faith is courage, to be able to withstand in the evil day, to be able to withstand the garbage that's tossed at you, to be able to refuse, refute, rebuke what does not belong in the house of God, what does not belong in the eyes or the ears of your child, what does not belong to God. You can just put a period right there. That's the, that's the first one. There's more. The second thing that I would say is looking at that structure of faith that I just described. Take a walk back in church history. What made people like Wycliffe, Huss, Martin Luther, and I can give the names. In fact, I wrote some down that I think I might have even in my own mind, uh, Tyndale, Calvin, Knox, and some that probably you haven't even heard of. Marie Dantière, Jean d'Albret, Marguerite de Navan. People who stood knowing that they would probably be executed for standing their ground and not recounting and not changing their story and not going with the flow of the pressure of the people out there. Do you see Jesus saying, oh, you Sadducees, you actually have a point there. Let me, let me take note of that. Do you, do you read about Jesus doing that? And the people that come after, first the disciples and then many of the ones I've mentioned, did they have magical special powers? No. They had something very powerful. Faith. Not this sloppy stuff that people peddle around. They had faith to say, on this rock I stand, I shall not be moved, that the forces that may come and try to press me away, it doesn't matter what man can do to my body, I'm concerned about my soul, my eternal destiny. Oh, that's such an antiquated message. You really believe in that? Absolutely. Because if you don't, there's no purpose in you actually being a Christian. But what, what, how, how do you get other people to hear about this? How do you fix the problem? It starts right here. It starts in every pulpit in every church with the pastor, the priest, the minister. And it spreads to the people who are listening. To understand God did not give you a spirit of fear or cowardice. Faith, to use somebody else's definition, has a very strong component in it of courage. And that is the courage to say, I reject that. It is not part of God's program. I don't need to get involved. I'm sorry, I'm not saying stick your head in the sand and be oblivious to what's going on. But when it comes to God's house, it's saying there are limits to what goes on in God's house. If it's God's house and it's God's word, it's the preaching and the teaching of the gospel. It is the growth that happens when this word is preached. And fortitude, spiritual fortitude that comes, that says, I know in whom I believed, and I don't need additions. I don't need to find some new energy to infuse my life because the energy that I have is found in Christ and I myself am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because I know it's the power of salvation. It's the power to take a life that was disinterested, that was indifferent, to open the eyes and to enable to see God desires the best for me and if I'm really looking at it in the right way, it's not that God wants to make me into some Remember my sermon or my message of uh, the uh, stick and bun woman? Some of you might remember that festival. It was very Freudian. But the, the concept was that not everybody is going to turn out to be church lady. Okay? So I'm going to ask you, what do you have to lose? What do I have to I have nothing to lose here. I'm, st I'm kind of just letting it all hang out. I have nothing to lose. But I have everything to lose. Because I recognize this is not just about me standing here this is about a country that is basically on a slide downward, and we could stop the slide initially if the people who know, you know who you are out there, who have entertained the ministers, who keep talking about what I call the skyscraper stories, and it goes nowhere, and there's no gospel, but you gather in droves because it makes you feel good, and your feelings will probably take you to hell in a handbasket if you don't wake up. Now, wait a minute. 
Well, they could be nicer about that. No, don't think so. Because I really do believe in heaven and hell. And because I really do believe that the people who were called to preach the gospel and don't will take more people to hell with them and the people who are sitting in the pews just going along with it because that's a celebrity preacher right there. We, we put that person up because they've got 20 best-selling books. They've got their, their, their faces everywhere. We, we adore them. We worship them. That's part of your problem. I'm not saying find a minister you hate. But I am saying find someone who will tell you the truth. Find someone who's more concerned about telling you the truth about this book, about God, about life, about what matters, than making you feel good for 20 minutes while then you leave more empty than when you came. Last but not least, if you say, how could we get this country back? I believe we have a big political problem, yes. But you know what? We have a greater problem. If the people called Christians do not band together, I'm not talking about I need to agree whether we should sprinkle, dunk, spray or not. I'm talking about on the common thread that binds us together. If we cannot come together as a people, that means, by the way, and I'm just going to say it, probably make a lot of people mad, but that's what I do good, that really good. Quit making this about race. Quit making this about what's fair or what's not. Quit making this about how somehow you missed the bus while everybody was on it when you showed up late or made no effort. Quit making this country something you just want to suck off of instead of contributing to the very fabric that once made this country great. People came here as immigrants at the turn of the century. And they worked. And they worked two and three and four jobs to support their family. And there was not such a thing as will come because we'll live on handouts and someone will give us things. It was coming to a new land for a new life, which included the ability to worship, the ability to be what God intended you to be. Let's start by looking at the real issues that affect the church. The church is not a charity. Please, for those of you who insist it is, read the New Testament and tell me where you find that Jesus said, it's a charity. I don't see Jesus ever standing on a street corner holding up a placard saying, repent. I don't see it. Do you know what I, do you know what I, I see? I see Jesus showing up, relating to people, talking to them where the rubber meets the road, exactly where they are, and telling them, I am the way. Follow me. I don't read anything else. I read about God's grace. Sinners are welcome here. You come in this door, somebody look you up and down or the wrong way, I'll be putting them out to the curb. There's no place for that here. There was never any place for that in God's house. And more importantly than all this is the message. That will be the salvation or the destruction of this country. Somebody said, well, do you think that God has taken his hand off this country? Do you think that, well, I'm going to ask you something. Once more, quite controversial. Do you think God would approve? I'm asking you to look inside your heart. Do you think God would approve? Whether people do what they do, but I'm going to use one singular thing. That's happened here in California. A law that was passed that a woman can give birth to a child and basically minutes or a period of time after the child's born, they can just leave the child off to the side and let it die and there's no consequences. That's called murder, my friends. That child could at least be given up for adoption, placed in careful and caring hands. We made a law that puts the seal of approval on that. You don't think that that's something to look at? I believe that's called murder, to let a child just die. 
and yet it seems like we've all, we've all turned a deaf ear and no one's outraged about this. Do you see what I'm saying? It's almost like if you keep repeating something often enough, you either become numb to it or you accept it and you just move on. I'm not willing to accept it. I'm not willing to move on and I'm not willing to say that's normal because it is not normal. Not in the church and not in the life of a Christian. Now listen, under your roof and in your house, whatever you do, that's your business. Taking the values and the things we learn from God and actually trying to apply them would open actually the eyes of people to say there's something wrong with some of these things. And we need to get back to at least the normalcy that we once knew as a people of faith who are not so openly, I'm not telling you be closed-minded, but not so open to accept every doctrine and every ideology that now we just put our seal of approval on anything because it all goes. I'm sorry, but as your pastor, I'm not willing to do that. I've never stood here and condemned. I've never stood here and said, I'm against the homosexuality. I'm against abortion. I've never articulated that. I've said to you, God, you've got to sort this out with him. But I am not willing to stand here and say, I approve or it's okay. And the only way to counterbalance this is to keep preaching, to keep teaching with the hopes that God will somehow get this message out to enough people who have heard and know what's right, and stand and say, I stand on God's word, and I stand on his promises, and I stand by faith with courage that whatever happens, I know I am standing on that rock that gave me new life, that I will not change one iota of that gift that was given to me to swap it out for some doctrine that means nothing, that has no power. So, if anything, as I said, my hope and my prayer, which I, I, I don't know, this is all <laughs> putting this out here. My hope and my prayer is that somewhere, maybe some of you share this message with people and you spread it around and maybe enough people hear and they decide, I'm tired of this too and I don't want this either. And I want, I want the ways of God in my life, not the ways of government, not the ways of the world. I want God's ways once more and I don't want to even have to think twice about it because I know this, whatever happens here, I'm responsible for not opening my mouth. Do you know that? But don't put it all on me, because now I've opened my mouth. It falls also on the backs of those who have heard. We all have a share in this, and again, it's not just my country, <laughs> it's ours. It's not, this is not my church, this is his church. So putting all things in perspective, I'm gonna leave you with one Simple scripture, I can do all things through Christ, through Jesus Christ who strengthens me. And that strength gives me faith, courage, and fortitude to stand in the face of anything that comes my way. You may think, I've heard the message, I shall not be moved. You light a stick of dynamite and you will be. No, I shall not be moved from the word of God and from the principles that live in my heart because these are the words of God the words of life, the way, the truth, and the life. I stand on that, and I pray you do too. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.